It's great to be with you. We, uh, Larley and I got here yesterday afternoon, checked in to the local Oaks Bed and Breakfast, which was, as you imagined, wonderful. And we were appropriately, hilariously entertained last night about Gulp and Grace. And it was just a blast in the parish hall. In fact, if, uh, if you follow on Instagram, I, had Laralee, I took a picture of Laralee and uh, Miss Kitty. Um, <laughs> and it was great. We had a lot of fun. And uh, they j did a fine job as well as a really nice ham dinner. So thank you extraordinarily for your hospitality. Um, that's a part of what come Laralee and I actually enjoy going from church to church, but there is a special place in our life for what's happening here at Good Shepherd because of the kindness and hospitality and clear you know, capacity that you all have to enjoy each other's company. You know, that is not always true. And the fact that you all have that kind of common life together speaks volumes about who you are and about the kind of church that you want to be, meaning a church that genuinely cares about each other, a church that reflects, actually, the character of the Good Shepherd. Um, churches have callings. Names are not without significance in terms of the name of the church. And more often than not, as a church begins to wrestle with questions around who they are, what's the vision, what's their future, um, the name of the church should say something important about how they see themselves. And certainly that's true here in terms of your commitment to care for one another. And because you are, in fact, commonly under the care of a good shepherd who loves you so very, very much. That actually plays right into what I want to talk about in terms of the content of the sermon. Because we are, in essence, challenged by something in the opening prayer, the collect, where we ask God to help us to, quote unquote, run without stumbling, that we might obtain your heavenly promises. Stumbling means I face a point in my life where I just want to give up. I'm not sure what I believe anymore, and I need to walk away. Uh, some of the stories I heard earlier even today from the confirmand said that a couple of people told about sort of hitting that kind of wall and wandering and now coming back and being able to do so with tremendous joy. The challenge becomes, is there a way to help keep that from happening? So that what we have is a kind of consistency in our walk. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Doesn't mean we're not going to do things we shouldn't do. But stumbling in the collect has everything to do with stumbling in belief in walking the way, walking away, not stumbling because we sinned this week. If that were the case, the church would be empty and your bishop would not be present. <laughs> All of us wrestle with those things. But this has to do with literally walking away from the faith. Is there a way to prevent that? Now, Paul in his epistle to the, the second epistle to the Thessalonians actually has that challenge with the Thessalonians. Why? Two things are going on. One, they are facing serious and severe persecution. In other words, they're paying a high personal price to say that they belong to Jesus. And I was saying this again to the confirmands earlier, we who are a part of this global Anglican communion have sisters and brothers in Christ in other parts of the world who are suffering for their faith. Martyrs are being made in our midst. People in many places on the planet are facing an extraordinarily high price only because they have said yes to Jesus Christ. So in fact, this epistle to the second Thessalonians, second to Thessalonians rather, is pertinent to what's actually going on globally among Christians right now. And so what does Paul do? I actually want to turn to the reading and just hold up a couple of things. And they have everything to do with how to walk in a way that helps prevent this kind of stumbling. First thing he does, and it comes right out of the gate in terms of his introduction. Paul's introductions to his epistles always have meaning in terms of what he wants to say later in his letter. It, it's never an idle, hi, my name is Greg Brewer, nice to meet you. It has more to do with that. And, he, and it has to do, in this case, with how he talks about God. He says, 
Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God who? Our Father, notice. And not just Jesus Christ, Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he repeats it. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father. Not God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a difference, you see. Our Father. In other words, what he's trying to say here is that he's saying something very, very important about the character of God and God's commitment to care for us as his people. You see, if you're in difficulty, one of the things that almost always happens is that you begin to doubt the good character of God. I mean, if God's so good, how come all these terrible things are happening to me, see? And so that's where he starts. He affirms in a very clear way the goodness of God's character because Father in the New Testament has good connotations. Now, plenty of people don't have those connotations when it comes to them talking about their dads. And so it's important that there be this kind of corrective because God as Father means someone who cares, someone who provides, someone who watches out for, someone who is committed to never leaving you, uh, there's this wonderful cr contemporary chorus by Chris Tom Tomlin called, You're a Good, Good Father. And it, it's repeated over and over and over again. And it's, it's almost like, a yeah, that's where my identity comes from. I'm not just out here on my own. I actually have a God who profoundly, deeply, and personally cares for me and who has promised in Jesus that he will never leave me. That's Father. And then he says, the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning, and who is Lord? Lord is one who's in control. In other words, there isn't anything that's going to happen to me that is actually going to get in the way of God in Jesus having his way in me because if he's Lord, he's stronger literally than anything else. And therefore I can trust him, which means no matter what I face in life, even if it is in fact my own martyrdom. I know that even in that moment, God will be there upholding me, and that in fact, even if I were to die for the faith, he will immediately take me into his arms and carry me into heaven, into that place where there is no pain and there is no grief, where God wipes away every tear from every eye. In other words, lordship in this context means someone stronger than anything that might come against me. Do you hear that? Some greater than anything that might come against me. He is Lord. So right out. Who is God? He is a good father. He, his character is such that he tenderly cares for me as his own and that he will never leave me. Companionship. No rejection. There is now co no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Sins are right now and ever will be forgiven. God will never look at me in the eye and say, yeah, I know you say you belong to Jesus, but there are things in your life that don't show that at all. So maybe I shouldn't think about you when it comes to heaven, huh? That's, that's not who he is. He is a God who reflects kindness and mercy. And so his love is constant. And not only is this constant fatherly love ours, in Christ Jesus, but we also have the strong companionship of that presence where Jesus exerts his lordship so that no matter what I might endure, even if it is the worst possible circumstances, nothing, as Paul writes in Romans, will separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he is Lord, because nothing is stronger than he is. So fatherhood and lordship straight out of the gate. Two other things that he says to which I want to call your attention. He talks about two things that are reflective of the life of this church. He says, verse 3, we all must always give thanks to God for you. In other words, how could we do anything less, brothers and sisters, as it is right, because your faith is growing abundantly. In other words, have you ever been in a church where people say, you know, something really wonderful is happening here? Whenever there's that kind of enthusiasm that has everything to do with an ever-increasing level of faith. 
People begin to take risks for the sake of the kingdom that they wouldn't normally. They begin to see visible prayers answered. Lives are being changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's clear that this is a supernatural fellowship. It's not just that people are gathering together because they like to affiliate with each other. It's that God has called them there and they have that sense and that they're called to be a part of a local congregation for a purpose greater than their own. In other words, I'm not just showing up at Good Shepherd because it's a place where I get my needs met. No church will ever entirely meet your needs or mine. Instead, I'm here because I know the love of God in this place. God is drawing me to himself here. Something good is happening here. In other words, it's bigger than a club of people who like each other. It's actually an instrument that God is using for the sake of changing people's lives and actually making a positive difference in the community in which they serve. Those are the evidence of ever-increasing or abundant faith. It's not just the faith that kind of gets me through, although sometimes it all feels like that, right? All of us have days where if we've gotten through the day, that's pretty heroic, right? Nod your head. It is true, but that's not the norm. If that's the norm, then there, there's ministry opportunities that ought to begin to happen to see if there's a, a better way to think about how you live. But in the lo- life of a local church, an abundance of faith indicates lives being changed and all the things that I said earlier about what can in fact happen in the life of a church where God is doing something, where God is on the move, language that 21st century language to describe what Paul is meaning when he talks about an abundant faith. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about what faith is. Faith in its essence means trust. That's actually a better word in our vocabulary to describe what Paul is talking about. So that if I have faith in you, A part of what that means is, I trust you. I trust you to be consistent. I I trust you to be who you say you are. I trust you that you're not going to become somebody else. I, I trust you that, in fact, you're going to make good on the things that you say. All of that has everything to do with how Paul talks about when he talks about faith. So when this applies to God, to say that I have faith in God means above everything that I trust him. And I trust him because he is who he says he is. He is that good, good father. And therefore, I can trust that it's good to be in the presence of God. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. And the fact that that's the best place to go literally in the entire universe is to be there and to be in his presence. Why? Because not only is he that good father, he is that good father toward you and me. In other words, what we see in the gospel is that there is nothing in my life that disqualifies me from God's great goodness and mercy. If I believe in him, I am his child and he will never let me go. So it's not only a faith in God's goodness, but it's also a faith or trust in God's goodness towards me. That that I'm not somehow the special object of his derision or his, you know, I just don't have time for you. We know people like that. (laughs) I had a neighbor, in fact. And she was this kind of a narcissist, actually. If she got her way, she would love you. But if she didn't get her way, she would say with unbelievable kind of dismissiveness. She would, she'd hardly talk to you. And if you pushed her, she'd say, I'm sorry, I just don't have time for you. Uh, I mean, extraordinarily rude. Um, God is not like that. God never says, I don't have time for you. Instead, his goodness is directly related to how he relates to his people. So I trust in God's goodness. I trust in God's goodness towards me. And I trust that that goodness is not passive, but instead I'm trusting in God's present activity. In other words, I believe with all my heart that God is, in fact, at work. And he's at work in my life. You know, sometimes you feel that and sometimes you don't. 
Feelings are not a very good indicator of whether God is at work in your life or not. You are much bigger and much deeper, and that's important, much deeper than anything that you might particularly feel in the moment. But that God is not somehow passively sitting up on some throne somewhere saying, oh, let's see how you do this, do with this one. No, no, he's actually involved in a very personal way in my life and that I trust that that's going to happen. That's what Paul means in the midst of great difficulty. Writing from a jail cell, by the way, in Philippians, when he says, I can do what? All things through Christ who's doing what? Who strengthens me. In other words, he's trusting in God's good activity in his life right now in a jail cell. In other words, jail cells don't mean God has abandoned you. That's not what a father does. Not a good father anyway. A good father can be right there even when his child is in a jail cell. That's the commitment we make to our kids, is it not? I love you no matter what. That's God. So I trust in God's goodness, his goodness towards me, his present activity in my life. And because, fourthly and lastly, because Jesus is Lord, I can trust in God's future. God's promise to literally make all things right. The new heaven and the new earth. I may die with a hundred questions on my lips about what's happening in me, the tragedy of cancer, the loss of a loved one, the all of the difficult things that you and I endure. But Jesus laid that out as normal when he said to his people, in the world you will have tribulation. There is no promise in the New Testament that to be a Christian means I get my way. Hello? (laughs) No, instead, the promise of the New Testament is God's faithful character who will never leave us, who will make all things right, who will pour his grace and mercy within us, who will occasionally, into our wondrous astonishment, answer our prayers, but not always. Sometimes he says no. And that when I finally stand before the throne of heaven, when I have shed the body, taken on a resurrection body, and Paul writes, then I shall know, even also as I am known, all of my life, including my questions, will be answered. Life will make sense, and I will live in the praise of God who has had his good way in my life. In other words, the end of life is not, life's awful, then you die. No, no, no. We live literally within a world absolutely imbued by eternity itself. And God's good purpose is at work. You see, how can these people who are coming up for confirmation even begin to make the kinds of what I believe are courageous, if not audacious, commitments? Or how could you have done that when you were confirmed? And has everything to do with this is my, t- I can do that because I trust in God. I will with God's help. And when I have that kind of faith working and operating in and through me, it changes me and it changes the church. New love begins to be released for the most unlikely of people because they are no longer under condemnation. But instead, they say, come on, let's go do this together for the sake of the kingdom. Rumors made for people who are doubters and who may not even fit in. That's the Zacchaeus story. There's a parable in Zacchaeus. The rejected traitor who collaborated with the Romans is the person that Jesus went to and said, I'm coming to stay at your house. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. And when a church has that kind of faith, they begin to see people who don't look like everybody else, but God begins to give them a heart for those people because just like Jesus came to seek and save, God is drawing their hearts toward them as well. That's a sign, you see, of abundant faith. And the church begins to wrestle with their place in a community. And what can we do to make a difference here? in this community that we love and serve so well. So family of God, I want to say to you, you have a good, good father. He is at work in your life. Jesus is Lord and trustable. So you can say yes to him with the deepest things that are going on in your heart and life, knowing that he will not reject you, he will never leave you, and that you belong to him forever. And it is on that basis that we can make the commitments that we will make. 
and know that he, he's not going to change his mind and go, I, I'm sorry I ever took you on, or anything like that at all. He is consistent, constant, and good. And therefore, we can say yes and trust him. Amen.